uh, Dr. Abel is, um, he retired in 2020, but he really didn't retire. So he, after a storied career, 27 years here at UVA, division chief of Peds Ortho, did Peds Spine, set up the motion analysis lab, um, was chair of this department twice uh, during the transition from Dr. Wong to Dr. Renson, and then prior to me. Uh, and he was a real leader within this health system. And you've heard me and Dr. Zura talk about what he did for us. And I think all of us in this room who consider him a mentor will agree that he had a long lasting impact on our careers and how we practice medicine today. Um, but Mark uh, retired in 2020, but I hired him back. He plays a critical role for our department. He's was the vice chair for faculty uh, development after uh, he uh, finished his chair term and he was been instrumental in helping me um, uh, prepare our residents uh, for promotion uh, through the, the promotion process. And he has continued to do that, assisting Dr. Shen, who holds the vice chair for faculty development role now. And while Mark retired, he comes to the office Monday through Friday from like 730 to 1230 every day except when he's out of town. So I don't know what retirement really is in his mind, but we see him a lot and we're very fortunate that he continues to be part of our department and is so engaged with our faculty and, and, and residents and, and, our, and our department as a whole. But he's a tremendous educator and his commitment to patient care and devotion to patient care is truly second to none, uh, as you've heard stories from me and, and, and Dr. Uh, Zura. So Mark, uh, we're excited to hear your uh, lecture on your professional journey, motivations and priorities. And thank you very much for agreeing to be our keynote speaker. Okay. Well, uh, this is a, one of the biggest honors I've had. Probably should just go home because everyone's been so nice to me. I'm afraid about what I'm gonna say, but uh, <laughs> um, no, it's been a great turnout and I enjoyed talking to people, seeing people again, and I applaud Winston and Truett for putting together the conference, Bobby, and all the organizers. It's been really great. So in this talk, I'm going to talk a lot about myself. Sorry. Sorry about that. I'm going to try to relate how I became an orthopedic surgeon. I do have three messages. Chance favors the prepared. So the more knowledge you have, the more you learn, the better you'll, the more prepared you'll be to take advantage of opportunity. And it's the long haul that counts. Play the long game. Consistency, showing up, and having fun. And when you're done, have no, have no regrets. I have no regrets. So we start, um, here I am with my three brothers on the front steps of our modest home in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 1959. I was born in 54, so I'm five years old. I'm the bored one. Uh, everyone else is uh, focused on my little brother, but I'm bored. But it really belies the fact that I was quite restless. I think of the terms that were used to describe me when I was a kid, uh, hyperkinetic, sneaky, stubborn. My mother was French and she used to call, she used to say the first words I spoke were mach tu sol, which means mark by yourself when she was trying to feed me on the, and I, that may be true. In fact, I don't know if what I'm saying is true, but you'll, I'll leave it up to you to decide. But that's what, uh, I think that pretty much explains uh, my stubbornness. This is our family in Rochester, New York. My father was a professor of music played the trumpet, was a composer, and um, he graduated from the Eastman School of Music at Rochester, and he was coming back to do a, a two-year sabbatical um, at the Eastman School. He left LSU. So this shows I grew up in a, an academic household. Uh, my mother immigrated from France after World War II in 1948 when she was 17, and she was sponsored by a family in Rochester um, she was a polyglot. She spoke French and English. 
Italian and Spanish, and uh, she would use the practice rooms at the Eastman School, and that's how she met my father. So they courted and were married when she was 21, he was 26. And um, then they came back, and this was a, a bit of a trying time for my mother because she had started pursuing her own academic career and was working on her PhD, and this put a, a put put that on hold. Um, and ultimately, the marriage didn't hold up. They never had their got their uh, goals aligned, and they ended in a divorce when they were uh, in 1966. Uh, that was traumatic for us, a Catholic family, and for me. I was already fairly self-focused and independent, and that certainly catalyzed that even more. So the first job my mother took was at Long Beach State College in. California. And that was 1966. And California was wild. And, and so was I. Um, I was into a lot of mischief because uh, my mother was working all the time. And you know, I had school and my paper route. And uh, then I was up to my imagination what I was going to do. Uh, fortunately, the sneaky helped me a lot because I never got caught. But my mother saw that this was not a good environment for us. And she then got a job a year later in Connecticut at Long Beach at uh, Central Connecticut State College. And she insisted that the puritanical influence would be good for us. And it was. Um, we lived in, you know, I was a little unsettled, but I do remember at the age of 15 uh, talking to my buddy and saying, you know, I don't think I'm going to go smoke cigarettes in the car after school today. Why don't I, I hear they're having tryouts for the wrestling team. You want to go? And he said, uh, nah, you go ahead. So I went in and uh, I was like the only guy who showed up. So I thought, oh, this was going on here. Um, so anyway, I survived that and wrestling became really important to me. It gave me a sense of accomplishment through hard work and discipline. And it was, you know, my effort. Of course, I had a coach. Um, and it gave me focus, and uh, and so I it, it turned me around really, and I I did well in school, um, and I knew that university was something. After my upbringing, I knew that you had to use university as a as a pathway to a profession, and that your job in life was to make some kind of contribution. That's what, but. What that was, I had no idea. I didn't know. I, when I graduated, I was good in math and sciences, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do. My mother wanted me to apply to Ivy League schools. We didn't have any money to pay for it. I'm thinking, I'm not going to go to an Ivy League school. I don't think I can get admitted. And uh, what's more, um, what am I going to do? So I took the easy route. My father was a professor at LSU. I went there. It cost me $700 for tuition. I think it was maybe 1200 for room and board. And I spent two years there. And uh, I was, it was a very good experience for me. I got my partying done with. I was 17 when I, uh, when I went to college, 18 in October. And the drinking age was 18 in Louisiana. But that was sort of irrelevant. If you could put the stuff on the counter, they usually sold it to you back then. But I did realize that... Um, that maybe I should move to a more rigorous environment for uh, for my last two years. So I went to UConn. Pretty boring at UConn. There's not much to do. So I got focused and I did well in school, but I still had this doubt about what I could do. And, and, and what I, I thought about medical school, but I had this self-doubt that, you know, maybe I couldn't get in. It was pretty competitive. I had taken organic chemistry and did really well, but I still didn't want to admit this. And I was thinking graduate school, sort of like my parents. But um, in my estimation, my parents worked very, very hard. Uh, and they um, were both very productive. Uh, my father had multiple compositions. My mother had four textbooks. But it seemed like we, we were always struggling. So I thought, I'm not sure I want to do this. So four of my friends said, well, we're, we're going across country on our bikes. You want to come with us? And I thought, oh, OK, I'll do that. So we left UConn. We skipped graduation. And I graduated magna cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa, and just basically blew it off and went, uh, jumped on my bike. And we started riding across Canada. 
and I'm thinking and getting nervous. Uh, my restless uh, personality was coming out. My funds were dwindling. And I'm thinking, what the hell am I going to do when I get to California? I have no money. I'm no, not going to know what mm -hmm. I'm going to do. So I dropped into uh, the States over Sault Ste. Marie, Canada, sent my bike back to, um, to Connecticut and started hitchhiking around working and ultimately ended in Orlando, Orlando, Florida. My younger brother was playing semi-professional baseball and was living in a boarding house and working there. So I said, hey, Charlie, man, if I can get a job, uh, you mind if I live with you? And he said, oh, yeah, of course, sure. So I did get a job at the Orlando Fashion Square. I was the janitor. In fact, I was the head night janitor. I had keys to the whole place, ran the buffer, did everything. And the two of us then decided that we, we should go back to school. He to undergrad and, and me to graduate school. And uh, this is where one of the family connections really paid off. My father played chess with the chairman of the chemistry department. My degree was in chemistry. He looked at my stuff. He said, you know, um, I can give you a teaching assistantship. And I said, yeah, um, I really don't want to be a, a chemistry graduate student. He said, well, you know, why don't you apply to medical school? And I said, you think I can get in? Oh, yeah, you can get in. So I went to uh, graduate school and I started taking all the medical. I got completely obsessed. I, I have an obsessive personality. I got completely obsessed with, you know, I, uh, my mother would send me books by Louis Pasteur and Alex Carell, and I would read those. And I took molecular biology, anatomy, immunology, neuroscience. I took all these courses while I was teaching freshman chemistry and applied to medical school. And I was really lucky that I got in. I got into Tulane and LSU New Orleans. And I remember getting that letter in August and thinking, oh my God, I can't believe I did this. 1978. But I had no way to pay for this. So my father, I took, you know, I was sitting in his office at LSU that summer, and I, and I said, yeah, Papa, we called him Papa because uh, my first language was French. I said, what am I going to do? He said, well, I saw these, these Navy guys in the student union. They said, if you have an admission to medical school, they'll pay for it. And I said, oh, wow, I realize. So I went down to the student union, went in and talked to the Navy guys. They said, yep, we'll cover your tuition room, board, and give you $400 a month to live on. Sign me up. So that's what I did. I signed up and then, no offense, Bob, but I chose Tulane. I figured if I'm going to get a scholarship, I might as well take the more expensive option. So I went with Tulane. And um, <laughs> yeah, man. And, uh, you know, uh, the uh, that experience was outstanding. The substrate for learning, as Dr. Zur already pointed out, was Charity Hospital, what we call the big free. And this picture doesn't do it justice because this was after Katrina, but this was a bustling hub of pathology. And uh, Tulane was on the left of this picture as you're facing it. Yeah. And LSU was on the right and it was resident run. And they, the residents would alternate covering the hospital. It was upper floors in that tower where the residents stayed. I would show up freshman year in the emergency room because if you if you if you went there, they, the chief resident would pull, go through the stack of consults and give you those cases that needed suturing. So that's how I learned to suture lacerations. And in my sophomore year, uh, one of the medical students uh, had had a job in the SICU that he was going to uh, quit, and he asked me if I wanted, it. and I said yeah. So I took this job in the twelfth floor on the SICU, and I saw all kinds of pathology necrotizing fasciitis, tetanus to keep these people in dark rooms so they wouldn't go into tetanus with noise, open abdomens, crush injuries. And my job was really to help the nurses take labs here or there. But, you know, I learned how to, to put in IVs and draw blood. But the most important thing that I learned was how to correlate physiologic phenomenon with disease states and how laboratory parameters related to disease states. And so by the time I got into my third year of clinical rotations, I was far ahead of my classmates. I knew all about this and um, they used to call me a gunner. I probably was. Uh, 
but it was a great experience. And, and um, we all, you guys got an 80 hour, the 80 hour work week, but it, it sure was fun. Um, and, and that hands-on, uh, there's no substitute for hands-on learning. That's for sure. Ironic that I should be saying that because I didn't give residents a lot of hands-on learning. <laughs> so we have a lot of mentors in our life, but this gentleman, Earl Peacock, um, was very influential to me. Uh, Dr. Shabby, you ever heard of Earl Peacock? Okay, good. When I was a freshman, I had a deviated nasal septum, and when I went to the, the uh, infirmary there at Tulane, they sent me to this guy. That's how I met him, and he was a true general surgeon. He operated on the head and neck, face, the abdomen, urologic system. The only, the only place he didn't operate, hand, upper extremity, was cardiothoracic, and he had written his book on wound repair. Well, he did my nasal septal repair, and um, I began to research him. And I became fascinated with this guy because I, I was interested in academics. I was interested in everything. And I saw that he had been extremely successful on academics. Problem is, he didn't work with medical students. In fact, he didn't work with residents unless they asked him to help him with cases. He was very stern, uh, direct, confrontational, sort of like me. And... Uh, and so I asked the dean and I asked him if I could do a one month rotation with him um, in my third year. And he granted me that. And I, I went to the operating room with him and uh, held retractors. Um, I think he let me sew up something about that big at the end of the case. But I read his book. I learned all about inflammation, about wound care. And his book on wound repair, especially as it relates to tendon, was extremely influential and influenced a lot of the, the hand surgeons of the time, including Richard Gelberman, who I would later work with at UCSD. So Bobby's talked about mentors and his style wasn't as, as pure as Bobby had wanted, but I looked at him as a mentor because he provided opportunities for me. And his, you know, the confrontation and uh, the, the pimping, that was no worse than the wrestling coach, as far as I was concerned. And so, you know, it was, it was all good. Um, and it, it, he helped me in my career. To me, that's what a mentor is. So at, by this time, you know, late into uh, early in my, uh, my senior year of medical school, I'm still thinking I'm going to do general surgery. I'd sent out 10 applications in general surgery. And I had asked uh, the Naval Scholarship Program if I could do this rotation at the Naval Medical Institute in Pensacola, Florida. And it was a lot of fun. I went to, I worked in an ENT clinic. It was the home of the Blue Angels. A lot of, I to, had, with women in the audience, I hate to say this, but there were a lot of studs there. They were good. There weren't many, there were very few women pilots, but this was like top gun kind of place. and. I enjoyed it, but the most important thing that I, I gained from this were there were, there were uh, very influential naval medical officers. And when I began talking to them about how I might get a deferment for my naval obligation, which said I had to do two years as a GMO, then apply to residency, they said, well, the only way you're going to get a residency in a civilian program is to enter a field which is a critical shortage area for the Navy. I said, well, what are those? orthopedics. I said, okay, fine. So I got on the phone, called the 10 places I was and had my applications changed over to orthopedics. And I matched at Wash U and um, was happy with that. Um, I was at Barnes Hospital and uh, as, a, as a surgical intern, yeah, it was every other night. It was great. All you had to do was take care of patients and show up the next day. You learned how to operate. I wasn't real happy with the uh, ortho program at the time. Um, I had thought about hand surgery as an area of particular interest, and that was dominated by the plastic surgery department. Orthopedics was under an interim uh, chairmanship. So I thought, oh, what the heck, I'll, I'm going to send out some applications. So I sent out applications uh, to ortho programs during my internship. And boy, was I lucky. 
a resident quit at UCSD and I got the spot. Wayne Akerson was the, the chair and his, his laboratory worked on collagen biology, something that I was a chemistry major. I worked with Peacock and now, you know, I fell into this wonderful position. So I went into the lab and um, did that year of research. And, and I, I don't think it's any understatement to say that the Akerson lab and the work on early mobilizations of joints and ligaments and tendons with Gelberman, who was there at the time, um, is the substrate for what we do today. Early mobilization, you know, the idea that putting a cast on and cast disease was terrible. That's what I got. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll pause right now to say that the residence here at, UC, at, at, uh, at UVA offers residents the same kind of thing, cutting edge techniques. I'm listening to these talks and I'm so proud to be part of this institution because I think that you guys get cutting edge technology and you're learning from leaders and that'll, that'll take you far. And this set the stage for me in my academic career. David Sutherland was another giant in the field and he brought motion analysis to uh, UCSD. And I thought, wow, motion analysis. What is more fundamental to orthopedics than understanding human motion? So the obsessive Mark Abel came out and I, I would, after rounds, after I did, I would go into the lab and I would study cases and I really, I really got into it. And Dennis Winger and Scott Mabarak were also leaders in the field, and they taught me a lot about segmental spinal uh, instrumentation and children's spines. But, you know, I still had this problem. I was still trying to understand now how am I going to get into academics? I want to be an academic orthopedic surgeon now. And it was purely a matter of chance that a naval officer was one of the North American traveling fellows, a guy named Frank Frasca came through UCSD and I saw this dude and I said, Hey, can I take them around? So I was uh, 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 entering my chief year and they said, yeah, you can take them around. So I took Frank aside and I said, now, you know, I really want to do academics in the Navy. Um, I, you know, I don't want to go and, and just be a general orthopedist. He said, well, three of our pediatric orthopedists are leaving the Navy. I thought, okay, I'll do a fellowship in pediatric orthopedics. I love these guys. And, and so that's how I ended up doing the, uh, the fellowship there uh, in, in uh, pediatric orthopedics and becoming an expert in, in motion analysis. UCSD was wonderful, but the best thing about San Diego was meeting Jean Marie LeBeau, the brilliant scientist, athlete, and mother. Here she is telling me how to cut a wedding cake. I let her do that. She was a uh, um, really, uh, you know, the thing about choosing a life partner is um, if it's successful, you build a legacy. And I'm, I'm very, very proud to say we'll be celebrating our 39th year anniversary. Thank you, Jeannie. What's up? She put our houses together, put her career on hold for me to get ahead and raised our kids. I did find time for Jason and Michael to get out there and go hiking and do things with them. Poor Jason had to be the guinea pig, though. Um, that was hard on him, but he survived. And all is good. Then after my uh, fellowship, I, had, I entered the Navy, I, um, went to Portsmouth Naval Hospital. Jason was just a little tyke. And uh, Frank Frasica was my office partner. This is Frank. That's not his wife. Uh, I think that was a birthday present for him or something. I don't know. Uh, but one of the wonderful things about the Navy was the reservists that would come there and work with me. Uh, and they were, they were outstanding. I put Al Crawford up here because he was particularly influential to, with me. He, he was a Naval captain and he would come there and we would play tennis, very competitive. So he'd work on book chapters. I would do my work. And then afterwards, he'd want to flail me on the court. And so we would do that for several hours. But meeting Al and Peter Scholes and uh, Bill Hearn and, and, and all, 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 many of the very accomplished pediatric orthopedists opened many doors for me when I went into academics. 
they got repositions on pediatric orthopedic society uh, committees and on the scoliosis research society. The only unforeseen thing that happened during my Navy years was the Gulf War. And I was the one deployed to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait with the second Marine division out of Camp Lejeune. I was over there for six months and they learned all about chemical and biological warfare. My job was to go around and tell the Marines why they had their Valium, I to tell them, no, it wouldn't make them sterile if they took it, they would be okay. Why they had physiostigmine, that, that was what my job was, as well as going through medical equipment. Um, and the only fortunate thing about that was, one, there were very few casualties, American casualties. And second, George H. Bush was president at the time. George H. Bush knew what war was about. He was Second World War. He was in the Second World War, a pilot. And when the Hawks were saying, go in and take over Baghdad, I'm thinking, no way. He, he set up a no-fly zone and brought us home in April of 91, so I was able to take my oral board exams on time so that I could get out and take the best job in the country here at UVA. And it really was the best job in the country. It was a real sleeper. I mean, I, I offers at Hopkins and Pittsburgh and other places, but there was a newly established motion lab with an engineer, a therapist, a designated children's center, and John Blanco would be my partner. He wasn't, he was welcoming, not competitive. Take it away, Mark. And so I began coming here. Dr. Wong set up a contract with me to come once a month. I would take a day of leave. Kayla was doing the CP clinic at the time. So I would come on once a month beginning January of 93, see patients, and I started full time in May of 93. And by that time, I already had a surgical list. And uh, I look at Max, May of 93, that's when, remember, that's when they had the chief resident graduation. That's when they didn't, people didn't know what to do. They let the chief residents have their grad graduation party in May. And guess who was on call? The new faculty member. And that night, you know, the first big trauma comes in Saturday at two o'clock, all smashed up. And I'm calling the chief resident. And he had some bad oysters and couldn't make it in. Okay. But this man, Max Alley, showed up to help me out. He was still, there were still ketone bodies embedded from his breath. But nonetheless, he got that case going. And I'll never forget that. Thank you, buddy. Save my butt. On the store, and I ate one and I spit it out. If what you say, okay, whatever. <laughs> but, it, you know, I, I, I was laser focused on developing my clinical practice and I started outreach clinics. Um, I'm really happy to, to hear that Keith has kept the, the Abingdon Clinic going. Oh, it's a great thing to go down to Abingdon and see those people that are very needy. You don't need to go far to do mission trips around here. Just go down to Southwest Virginia. And we would see 40 kids. Uh, I would drag the residents down the Creeper Trail and later up Mount uh, Rogers the day before. And uh, research day was research day. I went in and uh, um, we worked on grants and we studied patients. We studied cases first through the motion lab and then through the harm study group. My focus changed more towards spinal deformity after uh, John Blanco left. Um, teaching and mentoring and uh, scholarship. You know, my scholarship. I had under over 105 publications and all kinds of book chapters, nothing compared to Werner. I know that. But nonetheless, I rapidly went through the ranks and I got uh, my promotions and it was very gratifying. Um, so, Dr. Wong, I can never thank you enough for giving or hiring me. I remember uh, when I came here, the, the question we had this fr like fracture conference at the end and they would throw cases up and talk about what could be done or what should be done. And I was there that as a visiting uh, um, uh, from the Navy to interviewing for the job. And they asked me about avascular necrosis. Well, I knew everything about avascular necrosis. I mean, it was about, it was medicine. So I knew everything about it. I had studied with Marvin Myers and we had an AVN program at UCSD. So um, I'm not sure if that, swayed you, but nonetheless, I, I was able to come. You can see in this picture, 
um, Frank and Bobby, they were they were just like medical students. Kayla was a young faculty. Trey was in the lab, and David. Then, but now when I got here, I'm talking about when I got here. Said so good. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> when I got here, you weren't there. Dave Deduck was my first chief resident, and um, I think he's overcome the, the trauma. But um, you know, the, the, the Dr. Zero talked about chief residency sucks. Well, it my, my Dave was my first chief resident, and uh, Greg Degman was my first chief resident in the Navy. But somehow I convinced him to come here. I guess maybe it wasn't me, maybe Dr. Wong. But uh, those Navy years, I met some good people, one of whom was uh, Degnan. Uh, and I think that's how he realized he could identify with you that chief residency sucked because I was his attending, first attending. So teaching, I give myself a grade of C, but after listening to Bobby, it might have should have been a D, but I don't know. I didn't answer. <laughs> No, teaching, you know, I, I enjoyed didactic teaching uh, because I thought that synthesizing a topic required a greater level of understanding and trying to impart that knowledge on somebody, to somebody was a real skill. And, you know, I'd seen my parents do it and, and I, 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 I like that. But the in the OR teaching was really hard for me. I mean, a control freak relinquishing control. I mean, I was very insecure. And relinquishing control in the OR was extremely difficult. But you can see I, get, I got better. This picture, you can see I'm standing back. I, I have my loops on and my headlight. And I'm allowing the chief resident to apply the dermabond to the skin incision. Step away from the child. <laughs> yeah, step away from the child. That's right. So um, I did have to learn that when you become a leader, you have to be uh, less self-focused and you have to focus more on others. And humility is required. Uh, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it's, th it's, about, it's about thinking less about yourself. And I credit Dr. Hostler a great deal uh, for giving me these insights. And thank you for coming, Dr. Hostler. Um, Dr. Hosser was the director of the Kluge Center, which was on these grounds when I was uh, when I came and I had dinner with her at the CNO restaurant. It was wonderful. And uh, um, she became a, a, a real advisor. And it wasn't such a subtle hint the day she gave me this book, The No Asshole Rule, um, that there was no room in integrated systems for uh, for bullies, basically. And, you know, you know I had my agenda my list of things that I needed to accomplish each day, each day. And, you know, unlike Dr. Wong, if the case wasn't going fast enough, <laughs> boo, I'll move over, I'm doing it. And that's the way I would do it. And um, I credit her with also instilling that level of civility throughout the medical center, because the way I did it, it was bullies everywhere. And so she not only provided opportunity to many women here, but also to many of the men. And I applaud you for that. Thank you. So this, I hope, underscores the fact that uh, success does not occur in a vacuum. It doesn't occur alone. And, you know, my clinical practice, I grew my clinical practice, but it couldn't have happened without the help of the residents, uh, my PA finer the non-operative uh, people, Dr. Lather, and my partner, Dr. Romnus, my administrative assistants, Brenda Lawson, Laura Simmons, any number of people uh, helped me along the way. And uh, the mentorship that I had, one of the, my greatest mentors and best friends is Dick Whitehill. Thank you for coming, Dick. Um, Dick was, he was a lot like me. Uh, in many ways. Sorry, I don't mean to insult you, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, I, when I had difficult cases, uh, I would ask him to give me, help me anterior approaches to the spine and help me really meant let me do it. And if I screw up, bail me out, you know, and, uh, and, you know, the mock to soul, I wanted to do it myself, really. Uh, but uh, I wanted him there in case I did screw it up. And he did that in the operating room. 
he did that on the ski slope and watched me tumble down many mountains, screaming and cussing and helping me out and, and fishing. He's taking, taking out fishing. And I, I'll tell you one story to demonstrate uh, my bullheadedness. We would go out, we'd get up, you know, and, and uh, leave in the evenings and go down to uh, on, on cold December morning for striper fishing, get up at the crack of dawn, uh, five o'clock in the morning and be cold. And he'd say, now watch out. There's a lot of ice on the boat. Be real careful. Y'all. Yeah, right. So we're, we're getting down to the boat and, you know, I'm, uh, I'm showing my balance. I'm skirting along the top of the gunnels along the thing to uh, take out the bow rope and shoot, slip boom, in the water. You know, I grab the thing, pull myself up. I'm soaking wet. And it's five 30 in the morning. We're, we're going to go out striper fishing. But uh, I thought, no way am I going to let this. I did ruin my phone, but we went, ran back to his place, put on a wetsuit, went out, and I think we caught a big fish that day. But I appreciate all that he's done for me over the years and has remained a, a great friend. Bobby Chabra, another guy who's been in, indispensable in, in my success, uh, a master educator, uh, a master clinician, a selfless leader. Uh, what can I say? You know, everyone knows this, but as my vice chair, he validated me because everyone knew if Bobby was my vice chair, I must really have, I must really care about UVA. <laughs> now he takes credit for recruiting. I think I did the recruiting, but uh, he definitely helped with recruiting Shimer and Brockmeyer and all the great faculty that we have here. This picture here, um, on your right is it hasn't been it's not what you, what it looks like um Chabra's hands in the back of dr lorenzen who's down faced in the turf there it's not what you expect he actually didn't touch him and just stumbled but it was coincidence that uh shortly after this episode is when dr lorenzen had signed the contract at uconn and left it and opened up the time for me so i don't know but anyway it was fortuitous perhaps I'm a social person, and I do think socializing is uh, very important, getting to know the residents. I've enjoyed that aspect of retirement. I've gotten to know the residents, and um, I love the camaraderie. Uh, Michelle Q showing a German how we drink beer in America. Emmanuel there. Uh, um, this upper picture is from the Fairmont Roosevelt Hotel when it, the Academy was hosted in New Orleans, and Jordan KCN, a Cajun boy, was on our residency program and we set up a whole evening of events for the chiefs. We took them around, had a big dinner down at uh, Doris Metropolitan, went to the mixologists. It was, it was a lot of fun. And then Jordan's parents brought crawfish up and we had a big crawfish boil. And this is uh, Hakan Pelavon, uh, who um, I, he was taking, we were going to the uh, Abingdon Clinic, and I told him that, that, that we would stop at Mount uh, Rogers to climb Mount Rogers, which is the highest peak in Virginia. Um, he thought it was a hike, and then I took off running. And, uh, he, uh, and, and then we, so when, by the time we get back, at least I had a cold beer waiting for him. That's the way I was with the residents. I love running with them. Now you can do it to me if you want to. Preparing for retirement, I, I, I see a lot of orthopedists who can't figure out what to do in retirement, and that's because you got a plan for it. One of the best things I did was uh, recruit Keith Bachman. His wife, Ann, is unbelievable. And he... <laughs> uh, no, Keith uh, has been a tremendous asset to the department. I think, I hope I've been a good mentor. This picture was taken at uh, Red Rocks National Park outside of Vegas. And the first thing I taught Keith, I took him to the harm study group meeting to get him involved in the research there, was that if you go to Vegas, the only redeeming feature is Red Rocks National Park. So I took him there and I taught him about Red Rocks. I also told him to take, stay away from the women with feathers when you're in Vegas. <laughs> So I've been having a lot of fun in uh, retirement. Um, I've learned a lot from the millennials. One is never offer advice. 
I won't offer any advice unless you ask for it. Number two, never pass judgment. Anything you do is okay with me. <laughs> you do that and you, they let you in and you can have fun. And I've had a lot of fun, whitewater rafting on, on the Arkansas, getting back into music, which I, I, I was raised with and really enjoy and um, skiing with the, the boys and biking and hiking. And uh, now I got my new puppy, Cody, uh, who keeps me really busy and uh, has interfered with my biking, which kind of bothers me. Gene, you got to take over. So let me just finish with a few uh, guiding principles. I've already told you, I think it's the long haul that counts. You, you got to have short, and long -term, uh, short, medium, and long-term goals, but it is consistency that counts. And make sure that your goals are aligned with your partners. Talk about that. Um, and try to create something lasting, some enduring artifact of your academic uh, efforts. Um, make sure if you're in academics to document your achievements and your accomplishments. Talk to your bosses about it. Uh, talk to your partners about it. Make sure people know. Remember to respect all the people that you work with, people who clean the OR, the nurses, and your partners. Acknowledge them and respect them. You can't do it without them. I think socializing is important to pro promote uh, cohesion and it provides opportunities. The people I met in the Navy, um, they've re they really helped me a lot. And, and when people come through to give talks, introduce yourself to them, get to know them, um, and recognize that it is true. In complex systems of interacting individuals, emotional intelligence is really the greatest key to, to uh, success. You have to be humble and be an effective listener. So I appreciate your attention. Oh, one last slide. I talked a lot about um, it, my academic advancement, but remember it is about the patients and, and I, I love my patients and, uh, and, and made friends with them and the families. And um, I think that it, earning a patient's trust is an honor that you shouldn't take for granted. And, you know, I worry about the shift aspects of medicine that you lose this, this important part. But to me, it, medicine is the ultimate humanity and you should uh, make sure that you don't take your patients for granted. All right, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate it.